My, my father was a he was a, a man of all trades. My father worked with his hands and he was very good. He did his own carpentry work, he did his own plumbing, and he did his own uh, electrical work, he did his own automobile repair work. He was a, a handy man of the first order. When I was 19 years old, my mother and father bought a rundown farmhouse out in the country, eight miles outside of Atlanta, and moved out to this place that nobody could believe they were actually going to live in because it was so ramshackle, it was falling down. I lived there for three months. Some people even say the reason Elizabeth and I got married so young is because of that house. <laughs> I helped them move there. I helped my father move. We moved all the stuff. There was one light bulb in the entire house. We ran an electrical wire. There was service. We ran an electrical wire and hung a naked light bulb in the, one of the bedrooms. It was that kind of house. Plaster walls in the living room. That behind that plaster were 18-inch hand-hewn logs. This, the front part had been an original log cabin. We didn't know that when we moved out there. But the place was literally falling down. No, no central heat. My father spent the next 25 years, that's not an exaggeration, the next 25 years rebuilding that house. He never finished it, and it was never in much better shape than it was when he started. <laughs> it was sad. It did have a heat electric. He did put central heat in. I helped him put the, run the ducts for central heat. So it had electricity and heat and water, although the drain wasn't always, weren't always sure about where that was going, uh, where it was when you, when you drained it. But part of the problem was my father had great goals. He simply didn't have a vision. And he would work in a room in the house, and he would get it all done. He would re put sheetrock, and he would do all the, all get the room, put woodwork, and he would stain and paint, and it would just be beautiful. He wouldn't quite finish it. He wouldn't get the, the door handles on, so you had an open, you know, you had that sort of thing, but he would move on to the next room. And he would start working on the next room, and he would get that in shape, and then he would move on to the next room and get that in shape, and move on, and then he would get all the way around back to the original room, and he would start over, because he had changed sort of where he was going with this. And I said to him one day, I said, have you ever thought about drawing a plan? <laughs> about what you want this to look like? He said, oh, I know what I want it to look like. It's all in my head. But it wasn't. He had no idea of what it was going to look like. And so he simply worked on it all the time. He was caught up in that frenetic activity. And he got a lot done. He just didn't accomplish anything. He met a lot of goals. He worked hard. He just didn't finish it. Abraham was called by God to leave the land of Ur and strike out for an unknown destination. A land that would be given to him. A destination that would be revealed as he went. <clears throat> Abraham's vision of himself was not a vision of living in Canaan. Abraham's vision of himself was not as someone in that land doing whatever he would do in that land. His vision of himself was as a person living in relationship with God. And so the action that was required was not mapping out his route. Mapping out his route has nothing to do with his vision of being a person in relationship with God. The action that's required is trusting that relationship. It wasn't just about what Abraham did. It was about who he was. It was about what he lived for. And that trust was the mark of Abraham's faithfulness. Abraham was far from perfect. Sometimes Abraham is downright weak. He does things that are 
unattractive. His faithfulness was not in his perfection. Rather, his faithfulness was in his trust. His vision of himself required that action. The end he imagined was not where he was going, but who he wanted to be. The end he imagined was himself as God's person. And that vision would determine the goals for each day, not the other way around. The nature of being human, what I have said before that I think is part of what it means to be created in the image of God, the nature of being human is the ability to imagine the future. It is the ability, ability to, it is self-awareness. It is the ability to understand myself and to have some notion about what the future might bring for me. We imagine what we do before we do it. We think about what we do. Sometimes it's not in words, it's just, but we, we picture what we're going to do before we do it. I don't know that my golden retriever does that. <laughs> my golden retriever, who I call a bottomless pit of need. But anyway, we imagine who we are before we act. We have a picture, sometimes, I think, most of the time, not consciously, but subconsciously, we have a vision of who we are. Mostly, we don't think about it, but when we surrender to the denial of death in our culture, we allow other people, other events, to determine the vision of who we are. We live in reaction to the scripts that are handed to us by our family, read parents, associates, people who don't even know us. What we do is separated from who we are. What we do is separated from who we want to be. And so we live in a kind of incongruency. We live in a way that isn't true to ourselves. Because we haven't taken the time or the trouble to think about what that self might be. We feel as if we don't really fit in our own skin. And the good news, not just the good news of Stephen Covey, but the good news of Jesus Christ is that it is possible to rewrite the script. It is possible to live out of our imagination rather than our memory. The end that Jesus had in mind, the vision Jesus imagined was the kingdom of God. Jesus came into the Galilee proclaiming the gospel, saying, Repent and believe, the time is at hand. The kingdom of God is near, within, at hand, among you. Believe the good news. It isn't a goal like moral righteousness. It isn't a place like heaven where you go when you die if you've been good enough and you don't have to be terribly good. It's a vision. It's a vision of life lived for the purpose of love. It is a vision that will shape all the goals and all the decisions that we make. What about the law that says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy? Well, how is it shaped? How is it understood by the vision? How does it fit with the end that we have in mind? How might I live a life shaped by that vision? A life of love and justice. Next week we are going to take a break. Uh, going to have a deviation. We have a guest coming next week, a man named Kenneth Caron, who is the General Secretary of the Anglican 
consultative council. It is sort of the official arm of the Anglican Communion. It is sort of like the Archbishop of Canterbury's vestry or standing committee. He will be in town, will be preaching at 11 o'clock, and will be talking about Anglican Communion here in this class next Sunday. Then the next week, we will move on to Habit 3. We are on track, trust me, uh, about that. I have a little syllabus that I've done for myself, and we are making progress, but we will be moving to Habit 3. Thank you.